Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was getting worried y'all were going to just leave. You're like, oh, (laughs) we're not staying for this one. (laughs) Those of y'all might not have noticed, but they all like vamoosed over there to the other side. So keep a good eye on me. Um, About 20 years ago, I shifted from having my $8 barber haircut to a beautician. That story, actually, we can talk about over coffee, okay? But the other day, and I've had this particular uh, uh, beautician for, gosh, maybe eight years now. I mean, you know, if something happens to her, I'm going to be in trouble. And over those years, just like your barber or anybody else, you get to know somebody. And, you know, normally I go in once a month and I talk to them about how her kids are doing. And one of them uh, uh, is into sports, want to know how that's going and how's her husband. He works offshore. You know, so, you know, we just kind of have a banter. And the other day, and she always asked me, you know, like, how's church going? How are the kids doing? Like, so we have this thing, right? And the other day, she paused and said, uh, I really, I feel a lot of guilt that I haven't raised my children in church like my mother did. Now, that, that's a particular boundary that got crossed. <laughs> you know, I go, we have a routine. And the routine is I don't ask her about her business, and she doesn't ask me about mine. And, you know, but we've known each other for so long, my heart broke when she said that. And I let her, sometimes you don't have to respond. Sometimes you just need to let people talk. So I let her talk for a while. And then when it was all done... And, and she drifted off into, you know, it's obvious she felt like she was over. Sometimes you can have a sharing hangover. You know, so she kind of finished and then went on back to our regular conversation. After I had paid and got up and before I was ready to go, I turned to her and I said, I want you to know, I don't think God cares about where you've been. But if you come back, I believe God will be happy. And she just paused and said, thank you. And I've been thinking about that a lot because of our lessons about this leper today. So there are 10 lepers, right? And uh, they uh, call out like they're supposed to, like, stay away. That's what they're doing. They're letting you know not to come near them. That's the rule. It's in the book of Numbers. And, uh, but they, then they start calling out for mercy, Uh, And uh, as they do that, Jesus comes close and tells them that they are made clean. There's a miracle that happens. And so uh, they go on, and they go to do what Jesus has told them to do and what the Scripture requires them to do, which is to go out, present themselves to a priest, so the priest may say, ah, you are now restored back into community, you are clean. That's what they're required uh, to do. And so they run off to go do that. But then, of course, one comes back. And, that, and Jesus has those words. Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner? Now, I think oftentimes we read that with the mind and eyes of my hairdresser. And I want to suggest there's two other messages we're missing in this story. And the first message is this. These words, first of all, most of all, recognize that Jesus is the Son of God. And that the person who comes back has recognized 
that God is present in Jesus' presence. And so he, this leper comes back to give thanks to God. He's done the religious thing, but he comes back to Jesus to give thanks directly to God. In other words, I don't need this religion. I need to have a relationship with Jesus. So he comes back, and so there's this recognition that this person of Jesus is special. It's an epiphany, right? That would be our theological word for it, like aha moment. This is God. Because as we know from the story of our Old Testament lesson about Naaman the leper, we have people been healing lepers all the time. What Jesus does with this leper isn't anything different than what the prophet did. Right? It's not the healing that makes Jesus who Jesus is. It's the revelation that happens during the healing that he is the Son of God. He is the Christ. He's not just a prophet. So this goes on to our next piece. And the second piece is this, that uh, God's power works through Jesus as our mediator and advocate with God, right? So those old words, he is the propitiation, he is our offering. So while the first message teaches us the gospel, a revelation of who the Son of God, the second one goes on to say that this man, this leper, has recognized that, and he happens to be a foreigner, okay? So this is important, the second piece is important, as a foreigner, because... God has come in Jesus for all people. You and I receive the benefit of God's blessing and grace for all people beyond just, at that time, the people of Israel. As we listen to Paul, right, talk about Jesus' great acceptance of all people, this idea, this revelation, that the truth for us is that Jesus himself has made us part of the reign of God, of the kingdom of God, but also of God's people. Now, how we respond to that today is particular. We have in our church, in our denomination, in our tradition, three basic Christian rules of life. They're not difficult. They are prayer, reading the Bible, reading scripture, and worship. Those are like the basic pieces. Uh, these are the natural ways, and what they are intent to do is uh, not, if you will, to create an exchange by which we become holy, but rather simply to respond as a faithful person to God and Jesus Christ who has accepted us and died for our sins upon the cross and welcomed us in. They're the way in which we remind ourselves God isn't waiting for us to do something to get better so we can be accepted. It reminds us that God has created us to belong and that God rejoices in every one out of 10 that comes back who will have a conversation with God. The fruit of lips, praise God. And here's the thing that I find so intriguing. We will spend so much money and time on other things, <laughs> believing that they're going to make us well or happy. And none of that's going with us. <laughs> none of it. It's just going to be us. You saw the queen? It just her. Her little crown got put right back on the altar. Thank you very much. Right? We will do this, and we believe that this will help us. And yet, I find most of us long. I think that's what makes that story about my hairdresser so powerful. Even I, who go to church every Sunday, we long for a better relationship with God. It, it's, it's a powerful human desire. Augustine said it's part of filling a hole that we come naturally with. And the answer is quite easy, actually. Go to church, 
worship, read scripture, pray. That's it. It's not really that complicated at all. But we get so hung up on the guilt and the worry. And so I'm here to tell you the exact same thing I told my hairdresser. I don't think God's interested in your guilt and your worry. Jesus already died on the cross for all that. <laughs> as far as God's concerned, that's done. Your sin's been washed away. That's what we say in baptism. All of that is taken care of for you. You can't earn God's love. God's love is free for you all right now, as it has always been. And all God is interested in is whether you will participate in God's conversation. A conversation with you. A God who deeply loves you. A God who has already had mercy on all that brokenness you carry around with yourself. A God who's dismissed all that guilt and shame that you feel so powerfully. <laughs> That's the truth. But God has already taken care of all of that. And God's waiting. Just like Jesus or the prodigal father waiting for the son to come back. Think of the image here. This is a powerful scriptural image. Jesus just waiting there for you. God wishes to be with us. And I think just simply God says to us today that God's ready. God's ready. God says, listen, I love you. It's not very complicated. Why don't we have a, a conversation, you and I? Why don't we pray? We listen. I'll listen to what you ask through Jesus. And give thanks for all the goodness that you have. For all the goodness you have. And sometimes it's hard to see that. But if you can name one thing, it's good enough for Jesus. So give thanks. Pray. Read a little bit of scripture. Listen to what Jesus has to say to you. And come back. Be the one in ten. That's not bad. And Jesus figures the other ten did what was right also. So it's all good. No guilt, no shame. Not in today's sermon. I don't think God really cares. I think God really is longing to be with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.